Sergeant Anthony Clem with Indiana Police Department again. Today in uh, today's video we're going to talk about some blood collection, blood evidence collection at the crime scene. What we've done here today is we've established a mock crime scene in the garage of our police station. Uh, while this is a police station garage, it's important to understand that a crime scene can be anywhere. A crime scene could be anywhere from a bathroom to a bedroom, living room, to a private garage, to a business. Um, it uh, very well could be in the police station itself. So what we've done today is we've created a uh, mock crime scene with some blood evidence. We're going to talk about some different types of uh, markings that are left behind by blood evidence. We're going to talk about some collection techniques for blood as well as other evidence that's at the scene. And we're going to demonstrate some of our equipment, some presumptive tests we have if we were trying to determine if something was or was not blood. Um, what I have here is I have some of my kits set out here for collecting biological fluids as well as evidence collection and marking and measuring of blood evidence. So if you want to scan the crime scene now, what we've done here is we've, we've created a mock crime scene. We do not have a victim in our crime scene. Essentially this is a very standard scene we could encounter in law enforcement where the victim may or may not have been deceased, it might have been treated by medical personnel and been removed. And what I've set up here basically is a, a sample of some of the contamination matters that we have to deal with periodically just from emergency personnel being on scene. In this particular scene we have bandaging materials, packaging materials for medical supplies scattered about our primary blood scene which would be indicative of the medics coming in, treating a victim and then removing the victim to a medical facility. Uh, we would come in and this is, this is consistent with what, my, what we might encounter. Um, as I do a general walk through the crime scene. I see various articles here that I, I identify that have evidentiary value. Obviously we have a, a, a primary blood pooling scene. It would be indicative of the location of our victim. Um, it's also evidenced by the uh, medical packaging and materials that are scattered about here on the, on the ground where they may have treated the victim. As I look further around the crime scene we have some hair uh, you can look, see we have some dark colored hair here and also near the location of the victim. We have a shirt of some sort that contains blood on it. We have some blood uh, pattering on the ground. Um, I see a hammer over here that appears to also have hair and blood evidence on it. As we move on to the crime scene I see a, what appears to be a blood smear here on the wall. Uh, there are various types of blood evidence and we make reference to them uh, either as drops or as smears or contact evidence uh, that would be caused by somebody with blood on their hand or on their body that might have brushed up against the wall. Um, you don't see a splashing or a pattering on there, more of a swipe we would call that. As, as we move further through the crime scene we see an area here that I have marked with, um, with scale tape. We have these distinctive patterns demonstrating lines. These would be a strong representation of what we would reference as cast off blood. Any type of blunt object that would come in contact with the victim as the uh, actor or the suspect would, would make a swing backwards, it would create a cast off blood. And these patterns are something that we would want to document at a crime scene of their um, size, their distance from the ground, their length, as well as individual droplets that would help an expert determine directionality, um, velocity, um, and other matters that would go to show uh, the fact that we did have an assault here and not some type of uh, self-defensive mechanism. Um, it, just looking at this pattern based on my training and experience, I, I see very clearly uh, one, two, three, four, five, at least six, possibly seven or eight cast off stripes. Uh, that would be indicative of somebody making repeated strikes to a victim. Uh, where this would play into uh, our prosecution would be should we arrest a suspect and they allege a claim of self-defense. Uh, let's say an example that this is a service garage and the mechanic becomes a suspect, uh, the boss has been murdered, um, he might allege that I had a fight with the boss and, and he shoved me or he pulled a knife out and I struck him with a, a large wrench that I had in my hand one time. Well, when we see a pattern like this, we see evidence obviously of multiple strikes. And the 
first pattern wouldn't occur until after a strike because there'd be nothing on the ranch. Once there was a strike and there'd be blood released from the victim onto the blunt object, on the backstroke it would then cast off blood in the opposite direction of where the striking was taking place. So this is a very typical cast off blood spatter. We can see this on a wall. These are very common in ceilings where an assault has taken place because a lot of times the strike is straight up and down leaving cast off patterns on the ceiling. Um, another pattern I have here for you would be another type of contact blood evidence. This would be indicative of a print, some type of handprint. Possibly the actor that had blood on his hands from the hammer or from an attempt to clean up some of the blood uh, might have leaned against the wall like such and would have left a, a print on the wall. Uh, as we move on through here, we have a towel. The towel appears to have some blood on it. And um, as I look here, I see an area of the floor that it almost looks as if there was an attempt to clean up the blood. Um, this could be indicative of a lot of different things. It could be indicative of an initial crime scene followed by a more intense assault that occurred on the other end of the room. Possibly after the initial assault, the actor decided to try to clean it up and then the fight went on. And the main reason I have this here is to demonstrate some of our um, presumptive testing equipment. So I took a stain that we're not sure what it is and we're gonna test it with some equipment to see if in fact it tests positive to be presumptive for blood. Also there on the floor, there are several blood drops. Um, these would be indicative of a 90 degree vertical drop, possibly dripping off of the hammer, might be dripping off of the suspect. Um, it's not uncommon and one of the things we would be concerned about in a crime scene like this is did all the blood come from one person or could there be multiple people involved. Uh, obviously you're looking for DNA to identify a suspect. We would also need that blood to match our victim. Um, so we would be looking at methods of collecting and testing for various people that may be involved in the crime. Um, as I spoke in an earlier video, it's all involving crime scene uh, photography and documentation. In a case like this, each particular pattern or each particular item of blood evidence would be marked, would be numbered, it would be photographed with a scale, that scale being on the same plane as the blood. Um, I have placed a few scales throughout the crime scene to give you an example of what that might be. Um, here on the wall, you see I've placed a scale. So in the, in the photograph of the particular blood mark, uh, that scale would give us measurement. Likewise, I placed the scale on the wall above the print. Do the same thing, would also give us, give us a measurement. Um, an expert can take the shape of the blood drop, it's elliptical shape with measurements, and it can determine the angle from which the blood drop struck and from that angle we can draw a parallel line and determine where the blood draw may have originated. Uh, the expert is rarely at your crime scene, so they rely on our documentation uh, of that blood drop, of these blood patterns, in order to make a, an educated uh, opinion of what may have occurred. So, that being said, we would normally mark all the items of evidence. Everything would be photographed. Uh, we would take our overall crime scene photographs from all four directions. We would then take close-up photographs of the various blood patterns and marks with scale. And then we would take our mid-range um, photographs which would show us the location of the evidence. The First thing we want to talk about is collection. If we were going to make a uh, blood scene collection, and in an actual crime scene, we would collect a sample from all of the various bloods, possibly a sample from each of the drops. Um, we use, generally, a swab. If you see, this is coming from a sterile package, and each package contains two swabs. And we would use a, a number of these swabs at a given crime scene. If you have wet blood, such as what we have here on the floor, it's very simple. The swabbing mechanism, basically you're taking a, a wet sample, you take your swab, and you're going to simply dip it into your, into your blood evidence. You're going to allow it time to absorb as much as possible. And we're going to make the collection. Making collection of a wet blood sample is very, very easy. Um, just a matter of taking the swab and putting it into the, 
the still wet blood. Um, what's important is that this is allowed to dry so that it doesn't deteriorate. Uh, we, we use a, we'd be packaging that in what we call a uh, drying box. If you'll note the box has air holes in it, would allow air to circulate through the box, which would allow this to dry without becoming deteriorated. Um, another tool that we use, we have um, drying boxes, which is a cardboard box that will allow us to stick this into it, allow it to open air dry for as long as necessary. Each of these would be marked as to where they were collected. Um, this particular sample I'm just going to package into the box, like so. Once that's packaged, that could be submitted to the crime lab. Uh, we would indicate on there um, Every time we would collect a piece of evidence, we would give it an incident number, a date, and the officer's initials did the collection. That way that officer was called to testify, we would be able to do that. Uh, the reason we try to get as much of a sample as possible is when this goes to the crime lab, everybody takes a piece of it. Uh, the DNA will take a snip out of it, uh, DNA typing will take a snip out of it, there will be several chunks taken out of that. Um, so we need to make sure we get as much of a sample on the end of that tip as possible because the more it disperses through there, the less accurate their testing and their samples will be. Um, so we want to try and get as much as possible. If we were to do a blood collection, from a dried sample of blood. Now let's go over here to the, our smear. This is obviously dry. I can wipe that and it wouldn't come off. Um, a dry swab is not going to pick anything up because the blood is dry. So we need to moisten the blood in order to get it off of there. What we carry is we sterile water contained in disposable vials. And this is all done to eliminate cross-contamination. Many years ago, we carried distilled water or a sterile water bottle, would pour it into the cap and would dip our swabs in it, do our collection. But you always have a risk of cross contamination. One of the primary concerns of an evidence technician at a crime scene is to avoid any question or any issue of a potential cross contamination, which could then uh, result in uh, your evidence being suppressed. One method that we do to eliminate that and for the sake of demonstration and time today, I'm not going to do that, was we would generally change gloves after every item of evidence is collected. So after I collected the earlier swab, I would have stripped these gloves off, thrown them in a garbage bag, put a new pair of gloves on. Um, each time we would do a collection, we would change our gloves to ensure that we don't accidentally cross-contaminate one item with another. If you, if you can see on my glove, I have obviously some blood residue there from doing the last collection. That could definitely jeopardize a cross-contamination issue if I did another collection with these same gloves on. So I want to collect a sample of the dried blood. I'm basically going to tear the, the cap off of the water vial. Uh, again, this is sterile water, so it would contain no evidence or no DNA typing or anything like that that would cross-contaminate it. I'm basically going to moisten my swab. And once my swab is moistened, I can then want to find the heaviest concentration of, of blood, and I'm going to wipe and swirl. And again, we want to get as much of a sample as possible so that when each uh, division of the lab takes a piece for testing, that there's ample uh, specimen there for them to examine. Once I've collected a good solid sample of, uh, of the blood, I'm going to do the same thing as I did with the other one. I'm going to take an air dry box and close it up. Insert this in the box. I would again mark the box with the date, the time, the incident number. This particular item of evidence would have a number attached to it, as we discussed in our crime scene documentation class earlier. Um, would mark you know, item number one, item number three, whatever, whatever item number corresponded with that particular swabbing. And this would be packaged and be prepared to send to the lab. 
The sterile water we use comes in these uh, ampules that allow us to drop it. Um, so we can use one sterile water can do multiple collections. As you can see, we can control the amount of water that comes out of it. So we could use this over and over and over again because we don't have to put the swab into the water. We can drop the sterile water onto the swab and then make the collection. <clears throat> the blood collection will be done anywhere there's items that we cannot recover. Um, for example, the t-shirt here that has blood on it, we would collect the entire shirt. We wouldn't need to take a sample off of that shirt to send to the lab. We would collect the entire shirt, the entire shirt would be sent to the lab, and they could cut whatever samples they needed out of that for their testing purposes. So, As we continue the collection process, an important thing to remember is that blood evidence such as that on a shirt is moist. It will rot, it will deteriorate, and as it deteriorates it will reduce the possible uh, accuracy of blood testing, um, reduce the samples for DNA, it can actually rot. It's important that we package these materials in paper. Uh, a lot of times on TV you see them putting things in plastic bags. Plastic bags are going to trap the moisture, it's going to allow the, the clothing or anything inside this damp to deteriorate to a point that it may become invaluable as testing. Um, we're going to use paper. And what we would do at the scene is we would collect that at the scene and package that in the paper. When we would get back to the police station, it would need to be dried. We would uh, put this in a, a designated drying area in our evidence room. When I'm collecting this, I want to be cognizant of the fact that it could contain trace evidence, such as uh, skin cells, hair, fibers from that may have come from a suspect. This could, in fact, be the suspect's shirt. We don't know that. What we do know is that it's a piece of evidence at our crime scene that we want to make sure we keep in case we need it later. Um, basically, as I pick this up, I want to be careful not to, I don't want to pick it up and shake it out. I want to be careful to pick it up, fold it into itself as much as possible. I'm going to package it in paper. It will be sealed up. Again, we would note on here the date, the time, the item number, the officer's initials who collected it, and it will be taken back to the police station. Now, clothing evidence such as this, assuming that we had it back at the police station, it would be necessary to dry this. We have a a method in our evidence room where we can dry evidence. We have a drying rack. We would essentially put paper underneath this item so that anything that may fall off this item would land onto the paper. Um, it would then be removed. It would be basically opened up as much as possible and it would be allowed to air dry uh, probably for two or three days. Yeah. The paper underneath it would collect anything that might fall or might drop off of the shirt. When it would be time to repackage this, we would basically package it back into itself. It would go into a new bag, the old bag that might also contain fiber evidence that could have transferred into the bag when it was originally packaged, would be folded up, packaged along with the paper that was put underneath it into one package to be sent to the crime lab for analysis. There they would examine it for hair, fiber, also the blood could be typed and possibly checked for DNA. <clears throat> the same would hold true as we look, we see hair. Basically hair would be packaged in the same way. We would want to put that into paper as well. We don't know whose hair this is. This could be our suspect's hair. It could be our victim's hair. Um, and there's no way to presume from what we see here who it belongs to. It would be reasonable, we know that our victim had head injuries. It would be reasonable to assume that the victim would have lost some hair in that assault. But it's, it's not uncommon that in the victim fighting back in defensive wounds, he may have pulled hair from the head of the suspect. So this could be either the victim or the suspect's hair. We would collect this hair. Again, from crime scene documentation, it would have a number assigned to it, it would be photographed where it is, then it would be collected into paper. Um, it, uh, sometime later, we would get a uh, known static hair sample from our victim. 
either by consent or with a search warrant, where we could obtain hair from the victim that could be matched and determine if this was or was not the victim's hair. If we found this to be the suspect's hair, it would be kept as evidence that if we identified a suspect, we could execute a search warrant on the suspect for a hair sample. We could obtain that hair sample and see if it matched our suspect, which would put that person at the crime scene. Meaning we have clumps of hair. Um, it's very uh, conceivable that our victim during the fight may have reached up and grabbed and pulled hair from the suspect and it landed on the ground. So that becomes an item of evidence that the suspect would have left behind that we could link him not only to the scene, but to the assault. We look at the hammer. The hammer obviously appears to be our, our weapon. It has hair on it. It has blood on it. Um, it's indicative that it might have been the, the weapon of, used in the assault. We obviously want to collect this hammer with the hair. Again, it would have a number assigned to it. It would be photographed. It would be sketched into our diagram, and we would take measurements to relocate it in the crime scene should we need to do that later. It would also be collected, packaged, uh, marked, date, time, the officer collected it, the incident number, and the item number. And it would be packaged separate. Each item of evidence would be packaged in its own bag to avoid any type of cross-contamination between the evidence. Okay, we're going to talk about the hammer some more. This is obviously an important piece of evidence that I've seen. Uh, my opinion would be that it was more than likely the, the weapon of assault, the weapon of choice. It's in proximity of our victim. There is hair on it, there's blood on it, there's a blood pattern, drip pattern from the location where the victim was found um, to here. We have obviously obvious cast off blood injury, blood uh, patterns, which would be indicative of a blunt object repeatedly striking a victim. As I look at my crime scene, this is what I find, and my presumption would be that this is more than likely our, our murder weapon or our, our weapon of assault. So we're going to want to collect this. Um, again, it would have a number assigned to it. It would be photographed. We would be doing sketching and measuring as to where it is. So if we wanted to come back here a year and a half from now with the jury and recreate this scene, we could put this hammer right back where it is now through our measuring and sketching. Um, I want to be cognizant that it could contain a lot of evidence. It could contain fingerprint evidence. Uh, we'll talk about fingerprint evidence in, a, uh, in another video later. Uh, it contains hair. Same thing with the hair. We want that hair to be examined against our victim and against our suspect. Um, in my initial observation, the hair that's on the hammer is very white, gray hair. But the hair laying on the floor here is very dark. Now, we, we don't have enough information to draw a conclusion, but one of our assumptions would possibly be that, hey, this hair must have come from our victim because it is embedded into the hammer. And yet we have different colored hair and clumps laying around on the floor, which could be indicative of the victim pulling hair from the suspect. So it was very, very conceivable that we have hair from two different people here. Um, we also have to consider we could have multiple suspects. There could be um, more than one uh, involved in this. I'm going to collect this. Obviously, I'm wearing gloves. We would do a glove change before we collect another piece of evidence. I would collect it as is. I wouldn't make any attempt to remove the hair from it. I would basically collect it and package it. Again, I would package in paper because paper will allow the air to, to go through and reduce the, uh, the chance of deterioration of any uh, biological evidence that would be on the hammer. I'm going to try and pick this up in an area that would be less likely to leave fingerprints. Um, we know we're going to process this for fingerprints at a later time. We also know generally how somebody holds a hammer. So the last thing I want to do is to grab this hammer by the handle the same way our suspect might have been holding it for the chance of destroying any fingerprints that could be contained on it. So I'm going to pick this up as much as possible by touching it in a way that somebody would be unlikely to do so. I could do this with a tool, with tongs. Um, but I'm going to do this basically, I'm going to put my finger on the bottom, my finger on the top, and I'm going to collect it like such, and package it. Again, the bag would be sealed, the bag would be marked, date, time, location, incident number, officer collecting it, and the item number that was collected. <clears throat> One of the important uh, aspects of having this hammer, although it appears apparent that this is our weapon, um, we would need an expert to make that determination. Depending on uh, the outcome of our victim, um, uh,
could affect our ability to do that. If our victim survives, obviously the medical personnel, they're going to treat his wounds, they're going to suture his wounds, um, and the wounds are going to be very hard to document later. If the victim uh, dies or has died, uh, then those wounds will be documented through an autopsy. They will be photographed with close range photography, with scale um, to the size and uh, type of wounds that were on the victim, and those injuries could then be examined by an expert against uh, measurements and photographs of the, the hammer to make a determination if this hammer could have or maybe is definitely the hammer that would have caused the injuries. Kind of uh, similar to, but was not identical to the tool mark impressions that we did in an earlier video where we actually were able to take a molding cast from a pried open window or door to compare against a, a pry bar. Um, we're going to do it mostly through photographic evidence of the victim's injuries and the uh, I suspect it as being the, the weapon. Some of the tools we have available to us that are presumptive testing for blood, it's, it's pretty apparent looking at this crime scene that this is blood. Um, the blood drops that lead to the hammer, the blood drops that lead out the doorway, those are those are pretty apparent that they're blood. I don't think anybody is going to, uh, going to be concerned of whether or not these are blood. But as we look at some of the evidence we have, for example, this swipe. Assuming we're in a service garage, when blood dries, it will turn brown. It will turn a darker color. It won't be your bright red blood. Uh, we're not sure if that could be grease, if that could be blood from a victim, blood from a suspect. I did take a sample of that, but what I want to do is I also want to do a presumptive test on it to see if it is in fact blood. Um, one of the methods we use for presumptive testing is called a, a phenophaline uh, disc chap. It is a presumptive blood test for blood evidence. The way these work this is there are several styles available on the market. This happens to be what we use. There's two glass vials in here containing different types of chemicals that will react with blood. We're basically going to crush those and we're going to agitate that, get those chemicals to mix together. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another sample of that and we'll see what kind of reaction we get from it. Because it's a dry sample, I'm going to put some distilled water, or sterile water, again on my on my swab. <clears throat> I'm going to make a, another collection. Now that's. It's a very dark color as it is, but when I apply the phenophthalein solution, it should become very bright pink color, which would be indicative of a positive uh, presumptive test for blood evidence. Basically going to drop this onto my swab. I've seen uh, oftentimes on CSI shows on TV, they have different types of test kits. They come out and they test them and they flash pink. These will actually take a few minutes to react sometimes. Um, sometimes they actually need to dry a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to place this off to the side. We'll come back and look at it here a little bit and see if it has actually turned purple. I don't know how well the camera will show, but it is it is turning purple, so it's it's testing um, showing a presumptive positive test for for blood. We're going to set this over here. We'll come back to this here in a little bit. <clears throat> Another uh, presumptive test for blood we have that I want to demonstrate for you is called, um, I'm sure everybody's heard of luminol. 
Um, I do have luminol here. This is not a very good environment. Luminol requires a lot of darkness um, to be effective. Um, in order to, to glow, it fluoresces in darkness. We're doing this in the daytime. We have light coming in from the window, so we wouldn't really be able to get a good video or photograph of a luminol reaction. So I'm going to use what's called Blue Star. Blue Star is a little more, a little easier to use in daylight. Um, it glows a little brighter, a little, uh, what the Blue Star tablets basically do is you're going to use a pre-mixed amount of water, which I've already done here to save us some time. Um, these are set up to use four ounces of water. I don't know if I can get this open with my gloves on. Blue Star training tablets are a little less expensive. Um, if you're not in a vital crime scene, we can use them, but uh, training, the training tablets will actually be destructive to DNA, where actual Blue Star tablets um, will not. Should have used regular DNA. We need your regular uh, Blue Star. We need your get out of the package. Basically, we have two tablets. The one tablet that I put in there was kind of crushed up. Put the second tablet in. You have to give them time to dissolve. You mix with your water. Basically, put your lid back on. Just going to agitate that water for a little while. Give these time to dissolve, time to react. While that's doing that, I want to go back to evidence collection a little bit. We have a towel here, and looking at my crime scene, I see a stain on the floor. Now, this being a, a garage, we don't know what that stain is. Over there, I see a very bright red blood stain, but over here, I got this brownish stain on the ground. Uh, uh, being it's a garage, could that be fluids leaking from a vehicle? Um, yeah, we have sort of, let me get in front of it. That could be fluid leaking from a vehicle, oil, transmission fluid, power steering fluid. But it could also be blood. I see a towel over here with blood on it, which makes me think that you know, maybe somebody tried to wipe up a blood stain. Um, could indicate a number of things. One thing it could indicate was maybe there was an initial fight and uh, the actor decided to try and clean it up and then the fight got worse and we ended up with a scene that he couldn't, uh, couldn't clean up so he fled. So we're going to spray this with Blue Star to see if it reacts positively for blood. Um, being that it's been wiped up and cleaned up, I'm probably unlikely to be able to get enough of a sample on a swab for the phenophthalene test kit to be used. So this would be a good chance to use the Blue Star. Blue Star and Luminol um, are used frequently. You see them on TV where crime scenes have been cleaned up. You always see the television episode where the, the wife goes missing. She's been missing for three months, and they tear up the carpet in the master bedroom and find a big stain on the floor. You know, because the carpet's been cleaned, they didn't clean underneath it. Um, I've seen training videos and TV shows where they've sprayed luminol all through the house, and they've been able to identify drag marks and drag trails of the blood left behind. And even though they've been cleaned, they, uh, the, the luminol will still be indicative of where the blood had been. Um, Blue Star reacts very much the same way as the Luminol. Blue Star is easier to work with because it can be used in daylight. It fluoresces longer, so it gives you more time to, to photograph. Um, Luminol will actually um, fade very quickly. If we were able to darken this room completely black and spray that Luminol, you would see the fluorescing pattern of the blood, but then within a few moments it would evaporate. So you'd have to keep treating it and try to photograph it while it was fluorescing. So I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to collect the towel's evidence. 
same philosophy would apply. It would be photographed. It would be given a particular number. Um, it would be collected the same way as a shirt, where it would be folded into itself to try to avoid losing anything that might be contained on it. And we would package it again in paper. Paper packaging will allow it to dry and reduce deterioration. Once back at the station, it would be handled much the same way as the t-shirt we collected, where it would be hung on a drying rack, with the paper underneath it to collect anything that might fall from it. Um, the bag it was in, that paper would later be folded up and packaged with it and sent to the lab for further analysis. So I'll put this over here, see if our blue star is ready. What Blue Star basically does, I can spray this on, and if it works properly, <laughs> it should glow a little bit, should fluoresce. Um, the Blue Star tablets I'm using today are a little older, actually expired, so there's a possibility it won't react. If it doesn't, I can get some newer stuff, but I wanted to use up our old stuff first. But, okay, I'll spray this with some Blue Star and see what happens to it. Okay, we're dealing with some light issues, but can you see the reddish, the reddish effect of that? Yeah, yeah. It's not as dramatic as television shows. 